Good morning. Welcome to this update for global markets for the 24th of January. The headline says this isn't a bear market yet. It could be. I don't know. I'm not particularly uh, wanting to form a strong opinion either way at this stage, but uh, certainly the possibility is is there. Now, we've had another week of uh, fairly extreme volatility, um, and that's all we've seen this year in the three trading weeks so far. It's been uh, really quite extraordinary, uh, the level of ups and downs that we've had. <clears throat> and it's, it seems like last week in America should have been a down week, but in actual fact, we had such a strong rally on Friday night that it actually got the market back into the positive for, uh, for the week, uh, which is pretty amazing. But anyway, we'll have a look at that action uh, very shortly. And uh, there are some very stark uh, comparisons with 2008 in terms of the chart patterns, I, I must say. So we'll have a look at that. First of all, though, uh, and as I've been at pains to do over the last uh, few months, I think it's really important that you understand the background uh, and, a, and an overall perspective rather than just looking at the charts and, and what the short term uh, ups and downs of the market are. So here's some really vital perspectives I believe that we need to keep in mind. Uh, first of all, good investing. Um, investors can flourish in, in either bull markets or bear markets. It, it doesn't really matter. Uh, you know, all the tools are there. If you don't uh, understand about short selling or you don't know how to short sell or you don't want to short sell, then it's very simple these days. You can just buy something called an inverse exchange traded fund and that'll do it for you. It's just like buying any other share and if you if you get the timing right then the value of the of the uh, of the share goes up so it's quite possible to uh, to do well in either kind of market and uh, and I think that's really important these days because uh, it's extremely hard to predict where we're going uh, secondly it requires an investor to think in terms of probabilities, not certainties. Now, the way that we're wired as human beings, we, we love certainties. We, we love someone to tell us that if we do uh, ABC, then you know that's going to lead us to a certain outcome. In the market, uh, that's impossible. And if anyone tries to tell you that, then you should um, run away from them very, very quickly. The only thing that you can do is to think in terms of probabilities. What What is the most probable outcome? And couple that up with some decent risk management and just go from there. Um, good investing also requires that you do not adapt or adopt a definite mindset. Right at the moment, uh, the market could go either way, up or down. Um, I don't really know. And I'm keeping a very open mind. I'm, and I'm working very hard on keeping an open mind because there is so much negative commentary at the moment. It's unbelievable. So it is easy just to slip into that camp along with everybody else and start to form a mindset that everything is doom and gloom and the markets are going down. Now, the markets might go down, but they might also go up too. So I'm uh, keeping a very open mind as to the near term uh, and indeed the, the medium and longer term. But at the end of the day, um, the, the returns that you get from, uh, from stocks are about its earnings stream in the longer term. And, and all the rest of this stuff that's going on at the moment is really just noise. It's all about earnings. Uh, however, in the near term, rightly or wrongly, the price of oil has been dictating where, um, where markets go. Uh, the price of oil has absolutely plunged uh, this year in just a few weeks, despite the fact that it was down something like 60% uh, through 2015 already. Uh, and so the, uh, the assumptions made were that the plunging price of oil would cause a whole uh, raft of defaults, which I think is absolutely correct. And we're seeing that now. But then that was further extended to say, well, if we're going to get it uh, defaults in the energy sector, then that means we're going to get defaults here, there and everywhere else. And we're going to end up in a major recession and the sky's going to fall in and all the rest of it. Now, that's where the assumptions uh, have just gone way too far at this stage. Um, no one really knows what the impact will be. So, you know, we just need to, to back off a bit and, and keep it in perspective. But in the near term, um, the 
rightly or wrongly, as I said, if the price of oil goes up, then the markets will rally. And that's exactly what happened on Thursday and Friday. Uh, if the price of oil subsides back into the mid-20s, then you'll find the market will go back down again. But we're just starting earnings season in America, and that will be the ultimate dictator over the longer term. Now, we've certainly got on our hands a period of very erratic trading. Um, there is a substantially higher level of fear around. Uh, we can see that in the VIX index. We can see that in the panic selling that, uh, that we saw in the uh, uh, middle of last week. And that brings with it uh, a whole lot of irrationality um, and, and also a whole lot of forced selling. There's a lot of hedge funds out there that are extremely leveraged and uh, and also uh, some of their assets are in uh, very unliquid, illiquid markets that they're getting margin calls on. So therefore, they're being forced to sell other assets that are in more liquid markets. So, it, you know, there are things being sold that just don't make any sense at all. And, uh, and I read uh, uh, I read just recently that the yield that you can get on Apple shares um, is actually higher than the 10-year uh, Treasury yield in America, and uh, and and yet Apple stock is is still under pressure. That, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Now, the economic fundamentals don't support a recession in the U.S., and I've been saying that uh, for the last two years. Um, and and also I've been saying that the precursors for a bear market don't exist yet either. So that's strongly rising interest rates. Um, et cetera, et cetera. And I've, uh, I've elaborated on that um, many, many times. So the fundamentals and the precursors for a bear market don't exist. Um, and bear markets rarely, rarely occur without a recession. I think there's been two in the last hundred years where uh, we got a bear market and there wasn't actually an economic recession at the same time. So it's a pretty rare event that that would occur. Um, there, yes, there is a broad global economic slowdown. There's no question of that. Uh, America is not, America's doing better than anybody else. They're growing. They're not growing as quickly as anyone would like uh, or would expect, given the level of stimulation that there's been. But nevertheless, they're still growing. Uh, China is still growing. Yes, at a slower and slower rate, but still growing. Um, so we've still got a, um, uh, we've still got a, a growth in the global economy, but it's a contraction. Uh, it's a it's a slowdown in the rate of progress, but it's not growth going into the negative or going into a contraction. So we've got to remember that. Now Australia is going to fare a lot worse than America, uh, and that's of course because of China and their demand for our uh, our raw materials, uh, and the fact that um, you know so much of our manufacturing has been. Um, has become uncompetitive on a global scale. Um, and there's a whole bunch of reasons for that. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we're going to struggle economically a lot worse than, than America. And of course, you know, we're right there with the other commodity countries as well um, in, in South American countries and, and Canada and, and South Africa as well. But through all that, sound investing, sound investing principles are still going to apply. And we've still got some really good Australian companies um, that are going to do extremely well on a global scale. And over the last few years, they've been pretty expensive. But a lot of those stocks have come back into a, uh, into a, a better, uh, more attractive range. And, and also some of those stocks have continued to rise over the last uh, three or four months. Uh, we've seen some uh, quite solid gains. Now, these there's not that many of them, they've, and they're absolutely isolated niche businesses, but, you know, they've done pretty well. So looking at the week as a whole, uh, the S&P managed to uh, gain 27 points on the week. Uh, the VIX spiked up over 30 at one stage, but finished the week down at 23. So a lot of that... Fear got washed out of the market. Um, however, I've got to say, there's still a fair chance that we could return fairly quickly to the circumstances that we saw in the start of last week. Uh, now, last week I wrote that uh, the August 2015 lows um, were, uh, were being retested and that the next support level would be the 2014 lows. In fact, they were tested. On, uh, on Wednesday, and then there was a huge intraday reversal uh, in America, and I'll get to those charts in a minute. 
Uh, we've got key resistance levels at uh, 1915, 1945 and 1978. Um, so they're the key levels to look at. And this is a comment that I made last week. Um, I don't know whether this is a bear market or not. Um, however, the character of the market has changed. There's absolutely no question about that. Now, does that mean that that will lead to a bear market? I don't know at this stage. And I want to take a look at 2008 uh, for comparative purposes so that you can see very clearly that it's actually going to take quite a few months for us to be able to say whether we're going into a bear market or not. It's not, an, uh, it's not a determination that can be made now. And, and anyone who's telling you that we're in a bear market is, is just plain wrong. Now, some parts of markets are in, are in a bear market, there's no question. Um, but in terms of indices, not yet. Now, the US market uh, does trade in two very distinct parts. About three quarters of the market is going down and many of those stocks are going down very sharply. You know, I look at literally hundreds and hundreds of US stocks uh, every day as I do in the Australian market. And there are a lot of stocks, um, obviously energy materials, there's a lot of stocks in that category, but there's a lot of stocks in other categories as well that um, are going down and going down quite sharply. So there's no question that a, that a large slab of the American market is actually in a bear market, even though the S&P index is not yet. But there are a small number that are doing okay. Now, some of them are the big ones, um, you know, Facebook, Google, Netflix, uh, etc., are uh, are doing quite well, and they're tending to hold the index up because they're so big. So my message is very clearly to you that you don't want to just tr be a bull or a bear and make a decision. W why not be both? Why not be a bear on the stocks that are weak and are trending down? So you're not guessing whether they're going to go down. They are going down. You can see it and be a bull on the stocks where the investment case is really strong and they're, uh, you know, they're going up or they've been sold off to a point where, um, you know, they, they're going to reverse and go up, wait for the reversal. So, you know, you can be both in this kind of market. So overall, it's, it's just a matter of simply taking the opportunities that present themselves and keeping an open mind about what comes next. That's the smart way to do things. So enough of me talking. Let's have a look at the markets and the charts. So this is the big picture monthly chart that we've been looking at now for a couple of years. Um, so we're, we're going all the way back to 1998 on the left hand side of the chart. Uh, you can see that clearly the monthly moving average is just starting to roll over now. So there's a lot of lag in this. Um, but quite clearly, the character of that market has changed from what we've seen through from 2011 on. Now, is this going to be just another rollover, a little rollover like we saw in 2011, rolled over for four or five months and then went straight back up again? I think at this stage, it's safe to say because we've formed a lower high and a, a lower low, this one is, is below the... Um, the August September lows that this is different to 2011. However, will the market just remain in a big volatile washing machine for the rest of this year? That's possible. Or will it complete uh, a topping process and fall into a bear market? That's also possible. But when we look at 2008, I'll, I'll show you that it's probably going to be another three or four months before we can be um, be sure of that determination. So therefore, that makes it important as to what you do now, from now until, let's say, April, May. Um, because if it is going into a bear market and you don't do anything about your position, then you could do a lot of damage before you actually get confirmation that it's a bear market. So you've got to take some steps. But what if, what if it's not a bear market? You know, equally, you don't want to just go in and, and just sell everything either. You know, that's not the answer. The, the answer is somewhere in the middle. Let's take a look at the daily chart because this will give us uh, a much clearer view of what I want to talk about with respect to uh, 2008. 
So you can see the most recent price action. Um, you can see the red 150 day moving average line, which is the, the line that I use. I prefer to use that rather than the 200 day moving average. Um, has clearly rolled over and clearly the price is spending almost all of its time below that moving average. So quite clearly, we have at least a short term uh, correction. Whether it goes into a bear market, we don't know. Now you'll notice markets significantly oversold. Uh, we did get down and we tested, um, we overran just a few points, but we tested the 2014 lows. And then very predictably, we've had a substantial intraday reversal on Wednesday. We got a little bit of follow through on Thursday and then boom, we got a really big follow through on Friday. Now, part of that was the announcement by the ECB. Again, boring that they would do whatever it takes. And of course, markets were always that markets were oversold and ready for a rally, just needed a trigger. Mario Draghi provided that that trigger. Um, key resistance levels are the 38.2% retracement from the start of this decline on the 29th of December. The 50% level comes in at 1945. And then of course, this is the 61.8. So it's the nature of this rebound that will that will tell me a fair bit about where we go in the in the near term. But let's go back to 2008 and have a, oh, I won't do it that way, let me, let me do it this way. So we'll go back to 2008 and have a look at what the market actually looked like then. So you can see uh, a, a strong uptrend, the moving average still going higher. Uh, we got a couple of excursions below the moving average. Um, and that brought us through to um, early early January was when we first got a break of the lows and we've got lower highs all through here. We've got lower lows. OK, so that's quite similar, very close in time to where we're at now. Moving average was just starting to roll over, which is pretty similar to what we're seeing now. But then let's look at the next period. So this is, this is the first breakdown. The first signal was January. We did go significantly lower. Uh, we rallied back a couple of times and then we just basically went up and down and we formed a peak again around about the breakdown level, slightly above it, but not too bad. And that was the 19th of May. So it took from the 7th of January to the 19th of May when the market was able to, or the index was able to rally back to that moving average, which is now well and truly turned over. And then as soon as it got to the moving average, you can see a reversal on this day here, the 19th of May, and then away she went and it and it fell very quickly and the, and the, um, the index didn't get anywhere near back, back near the red line until we got to June of 2009. So there's a lot of similarities. So if we wind forward to where we are, where we're at now, you can see quite a lot of similarities. So um, in the near term, we might go down and break 1820 and form lower, uh, again, even lower lows. But it's going to take a few months to uh, because we will get some sort of rally back. Um, so that's why I say, we, you know, we can't be absolutely sure about what we've got and, until we can look back in a few months time. Now, the Aussie dollar um, is trading at 70 cents. It got down to the low 68 cents, broke support. Um, but with the rebound in oil in the last couple of days, the Aussie dollar went straight back with it. Um, but as I said last week, I still think the GFC lows at 60 cents are still uh, realistic. Uh, the Aussie index, um, was higher by 23 points uh, for the week. Um, the support of the August lows was broken. We saw a, a very wild week of, uh, of selling, which included the banks. And our, our banks aren't particularly attractive to overseas investors. And, uh, and 46.50 is still the target. Now, just a couple of other charts that I want to uh, catch up on. Um, the small caps in America have been the big underperformers this year. Uh, you can see that this is the uh, Russell 2000 small cap index. 
uh, clearly has broken this long-term trend line, uh, managed to rally back to it a couple of times in November and then fell away quite sharply. We got down uh, very close to a 50% retracement and then you can see we, we did get a bounce last week. Um, so it's likely we'll get some follow through to the upside in, in the next uh, week. Uh, the other chart I just want to look at is the VIX. So this is the VIX index. Uh, there we are, bigger picture, just to put it in perspective. This has been a has been a spike, but nowhere near as big a spike. This previous one here was uh, August last year. So we got up to about 31, 32, and then we fell back by the end of the week to 23. So they're still not really elevated levels. There hasn't really been a panic sell-off yet, and that uh, that still might still might eventuate. Looking at the Australian market, this is the ASX 200. So we've broken broken the lows. We've rallied back to the breakdown. Uh, we'll probably see strength in our market on Monday, I would imagine. Um, but look, it's quite clear. You look at the moving average, the red line. You look at where the price is in relation to that red line. Quite clearly, the Australian market is in downtrend. There's no question about that. This is the materials index, so reflecting predominantly BHP and Rio. Uh, clearly, in a huge downtrend. You can tell that by the fact that the price is so far below the moving average. That's how fast the downtrend is. Energy, of course, has similarly been uh, smashed around. So it looks very similar to materials. And this is the banking sector. Yeah, nowhere near as bad, but clearly in the short to medium term, Australian banks are in a, are in a downtrend. The moving average has rolled right over and the price is below it. Now, you could argue all you like about banks and dividends and all those sort of things and what should be, but that's what's happening right now. Looking at commodities, uh, gold, despite all the mayhem, only managed to put on $10 for the week. There's still no support from gold stocks, um, so really no change in, in the way that uh, the gold index, uh, sorry, the gold price or the gold stock index uh, is looking Copper uh, edged a little bit higher, it was really just going with the fact that the US dollar was slightly lower. Crude oil got down to 26 and a half during the week, uh, did a big reversal on Thursday and Friday, which is always going to happen. This is really speculators doing some short covering so that they can take some profit. And it uh, shot back up to 32, but it's way too early to call this anything other than a counter trend bounce. And until oil does stabilize and then go up and down a few times and then and then start to go back into an uptrend, then, you know, frankly, stocks aren't going to go anywhere much. Uh, there's the copper chart. So just to wrap it all up, uh, as an investor, um, you should have a long term plan. Um, if you don't, you're in a lot of trouble. Um, but don't lose sight of your long-term plan because of what you see in the short term and because of what you read in the short term. Uh, because at the end of the day, um, you know, great assets will still go up in price over the medium to longer term, which is what you're doing as an investor. So my recommendation would be uh, to buy great assets on severe down days because I'm sure we'll see plenty of those in 2016. And it's not a whole lot more complicated than that. Um, lots of people make it a lot more complicated than that, but that's about it. So be decisive in your actions, but be considered first. So think about it, step back, look at it with a, the perspective in terms of which you're trading and investing and, uh, and don't get caught up in, um, in all the commentary at the moment, which is just unbelievably negative. Uh, and finally, watch the charts because it's the ultimate scoreboard. Um, everything else, you, you look at economic fundamentals, you look at corporate fundamentals uh, and valuations, and all of that is about analysts and other people making an interpretation of what they see and then projecting that data forward, again, making a whole bunch of assumptions. Now, that may or may not pan out, and, and you may or may not have taken account of all the factors that go into making up the price. So you know, my uh, overwhelming 
recommendation, this is, I'm talking to non-members here, uh, is if you're someone that bases your investing and trading decisions purely on, on economic and, and uh, business fundamentals, then you are missing the most important part. And that's the fact that the charts and the price is the ultimate scoreboard. That's how you make your money. You don't make money because the economic fundamentals are good. You make money because the price went up. It's, uh, it's about as simple as that. Um, you must know in advance, uh, when, when markets are volatile like this, you, you can't make decisions on the run because you, your emotions are just too engaged. So you must know in advance the stocks you want to buy, a price structure for entry, and uh, have a, a plan for managing uh, your risk and your profit. Um, and, you know, that's just so, so important. So uh, 2016 is playing out exactly uh, as I expected it would, because not because I'm, I'm uh, clever, but you just need to step back and think about it. With all the monetary stimulus that we've had for the last four or five years, the, the economic rubber bands have been more and more stretched and more and more distorted. You don't need to be very bright to figure out that that's going to translate to increasing levels of volatility. It's just, it's just a natural consequence. So to me, 2016 was always going to be the year that we saw volatility ramping up, and it's uh, certainly started in that fashion. For anyone who's not a member and uh, would want some assistance and um, look... <laughs> I've, I've been involved in the market for nearly three decades, and I can tell you, having spent the first decade and a half um, not really fully understanding what I was doing, um, I would have cut off my right arm for someone that, that would have given me um, the benefit of their experience. So if, you know, if you're not a, mem a member and, um, you know, you're struggling to, to come to grips with everything that's going on and how you should proceed, then I know that I can give you some very valuable input. There's my contact details. Be back to you next week. Cheers.